So, another episode of MOIP, or Mashinsky over IP. Thanks for joining. Today I have a special guest, Ron Nooner, who's, who's uh, very well, most of you probably are well familiar with him. He's the host of the CNBC uh, show that is all about crypto. And uh, Ron, tell us everything about what has changed since Corona. I mean, we haven't seen you on air since January. Yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you for having me on your show. It's a, it's a great uh, honor to be speaking to you. And this time with you on the one side of the camera and me in the front of the camera, it's a very strange place to be. Um, as you know, uh, to, at the end of last year, we took a, a production break because I'd been doing the show without a break for two years. And um, I think it's time to reinvent the show. And uh, we are working on a new show, which actually... I was going to launch now for consensus, but uh, given the stay-at-home orders, as you can imagine, everything is upside down. And uh, I think it's uh, better not to launch a show in this type of environment. And I think I'll launch the show as soon as you know, we get back to some kind of normality and we can use studios and we can have real production teams and, uh, and then we'll be back to full force and with a whole new show. All right, so I'm sure the top questions that our viewers are going to want to know is, where did you get your haircut? Because I've not been able to get a haircut since we got into It's very lockdown. simple. It's very simple. I ordered a device from Amazon that you can just do, <laughs> and I cut my hair myself. I've never done that before, but uh, <laughs> yes, I did not a bad job. Huh? Pretty good. Yeah, you look younger, so you're doing a good job. <laughs> I guess I do the same thing, you know, but uh, uh, so. I've look, never done it before. Never done I've never it done it before, but, I, but I, I mean, I had to do something because otherwise it was a disaster. So for the people who don't know who you are, what you do, give us a little bit of a background. Where are you from? How did you grow up? Uh, what did you do before crypto? What got you into crypto? And, uh, you know, what part of crypto you occupy? So uh, I'll give you the background. I was born in Israel. At the age of five, my parents moved to South Africa for one year. We were going to be there for one year while my father did an uh, engineering uh, secondment. Uh, 38 years later, we were still there. It was the longest one year of our lives. Uh, so I grew up in South Africa. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I had multiple businesses and multiple exits in South Africa. But uh, I guess as the story goes, I had a whole lot of successful exits. And then I went bankrupt with one big venture. And then I got up, dusted myself off, and built uh, South Africa and Africa's biggest sales and marketing agency, which I then sold to a company called Publicis. Um, I mean, the deal is a very highly publicized transaction. It was uh, between 100 and $150 million exit, uh, depending on which exchange rate you use. And then I promised my wife that uh, I'm going to retire and never, ever work again. And uh, that lasted a whole three hours. And I guess that kind of leads us to how I got into crypto and how I got into crypto was one of the projects that our agency was working on was a project called M-Pesa. Now M-Pesa was, is peer to peer money transfer, but you use centralized money in Kenya, you use shillings in South Africa, you used to use the Rand, the South African Rand. And our company was the partner to Vodafone or Vodacom to launch this specifically in South Africa. Now, what I realized then was that the concept of peer-to-peer -peer money transfer is an essential in emerging markets. But the fact that we were using centralized money and we had this central bank and government gun to our heads meant that we couldn't roll it out properly. And, you know, in many countries it succeeded, in many countries it failed. And uh, I guess regulation and centralization was the reason why it wasn't as successful in some markets. So yeah. when I saw Bitcoin, in fact, when I saw Bitcoin, I thought, this is amazing. This is peer-to-peer -peer money, but it's not actually the same. It's not centralized money. And that, that was when the, the penny dropped for me. Right. So, so M-Pesa did exceptionally well in Kenya. I think it's like 90% of all transactions, but it has not really uh, pushed to other countries, not just in Africa, but anywhere else. So how do you explain <laughs> that? Because I think there's a lot of lessons to learn, both for kind of the crypto community as well as for the, you know, the United Nations <laughs> or whoever. I guess, I guess um, a lot of Africa is culture. So I think if you look at one thing about Africa is that Africa is very, very, very cultural. 
when you look at South Africa, South Africa is made up of very traditional African cultures uh, and a whole lot of them coming from different tribes and, and, and different backgrounds. Now, when you compare South African culture to Kenyan culture or Nigerian culture, South African culture is not as technological. They hold on to their, their roots much more. So the average rural person in South Africa, of which there are about 40 million of these people, they are averse to technology. I think averse may be a strong word, but they don't embrace technology as well as the Nigerians or the Kenyans. And that's why you see that in some cases, in some, Af in some African countries, these things work, and in some African countries, they take longer to work. Uh, I'm sure that it will work in all African countries. It's just a function of how long. Right. So um, Bitcoin, you know, if you read Satoshi's paper, it's, the title says uh, a peer-to-peer -peer cash system, right? But uh, really, after 11 years, it has become uh, an exceptional store of value and not a very good peer-to-peer uh, -peer cash system. So what, where have we failed or where has Satoshi failed in his vision? And I'm not um, talking about Satoshi's vision, you know? We'll talk yeah, about yeah. that you're later. Not talking, you're, not, you're talking about you're not talking about the real Bitcoin. You're talking about the the one that <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, the original, of course, the original. So, I mean, look, I don't know if you can say that Bitcoin has failed. I think that we've just, as a Bitcoin community, we've taken Bitcoin. We've created a narrative, and you know, by creating a narrative put it out there, we've created marketing out there to say that Bitcoin is actually a store of value. No one uses Bitcoin to pay for things. I think there's a few reasons for that. The first thing is there's major tax implications in most countries if you sell your Bitcoin. You know, every time you sell Bitcoin and if you sell it at a profit, you're paying a capital gain. And that's a tax implication of selling Bitcoin. Immediately with that kind of tax implication in some territories or in most territories, you're now you've now removed the currency functionality of Bitcoin and you've actually made it this like asset that accrues value, you know, and that is a store of value. The second thing is, I don't think that Bitcoin has scaled enough. It's a lot more scaled than it was certainly when we got into the market. And, you know, now there's things like the lightning network and second layer, um, la second layer layering solutions, even including Ethereum, et cetera. But Bitcoin isn't a currency yet. And to be honest, I don't know if we want Bitcoin to be a currency because if you used Bitcoin as a digital gold or a digital store of value, which by the way, today, today in our times has a much bigger utility, we all need a digital gold or a, store, a digital store of value, then I think there's a very big addressable market there. Not only that, I also think that that can happen without any more modifications or second layer scaling solutions. It's working now as a digital store of value. Well, but it evolved to be that, right? I mean, uh, I think the, the, the problem that we're having is that everybody who used Bitcoin for any purchase uh, has regretted it, right? So by definition, because it's a kind of a deflationary um, digital gold, a store of value, um, we we figured out that after 9 million percent increase in price, actually using it for any purchase has been uh, extremely, um, you know, detrimental to our life savings. So, but fiat currencies by definition, there is no fiat currency on the planet and there's about 200 of them that appreciates over time, right? So, so you, there's no competition. It's not like, okay, Bitcoin has some other fiat currency that increases in value over time. And that's why we can compare A to B and choose which one we're going to be using. So for, for as long as there's an, we're in the adoption cycle of Bitcoin, we're actually acquiring new users and we're creating new demand. Now, that's happening at a much faster pace than we're printing new Bitcoin, especially after the halving. Now, as long as that's happening, um, Bitcoin will continue to appreciate in value. And for as long as it keeps appreciating in value, you don't want to spend your Bitcoin. Now, I'll give you an example. I'm invited to play in an amazing poker tournament uh, every Thursday night, the buy-in is 0.1 Bitcoin. I mean, that's my worst purchase of the week. Not only yeah. because I always lose, but also because I have to use an asset that's appreciating to buy into the game. I'd much rather use 
my US dollars, which are continually depreciating to buy into a poker tournament. So, you know, that's, that's what's, what's happening now. You know, I'm not going to give anybody any guarantees that Bitcoin is going to continue to go up, but I will say the following. Bitcoin is mathematics. The mathematics are very simple. There is an increase in supply at a rate of just after the halving was 6.25 uh, Bitcoin per block. That's the increase in supply. 1.8% uh, annualized, yeah. Correct. There is a decrease in supply because people are still losing their private keys. Okay, now I don't know what that number is, but let's assume that it's also about 1.8%, right? Now, you take that number, it's like okay, the supply of Bitcoin is con consistent or constant, less a little bit of, of, maybe a little bit more. For as long as we are introducing more people into the ecosystem, Bitcoin is going to increase in value. What happens at, at terminal point when the whole world is hopefully using Bitcoin, there's the demand kind of stabilizes and then it would probably be prudent to start spending the Bitcoin like cash. But for now, I think it's impractical to spend your Bitcoin from a tax point of view and because why would you sell an asset that's, that's in the peak of its, of its uptake? Right, and then right now, a lot of the people that join are hodlers, like the Celsius community is all hodlers, right? So, so the hodlers are accumulating the assets and uh, you need a broad enough base for it to stabilize, right? Right now, uh, there isn't a broad enough base and that's why it it's, can be so easily manipulated by just a few traders deciding that they're going long or short or USDT minting another billion or two worth of, uh, of new currency to buy Bitcoin, right? So, so you know, let, let's talk about, I mean, USDT now is the third uh, largest coin to, in market capitalization. I think the entire stable coin uh, community is about 10 billion and 9 billion out of that or 90% is USDT. What, what is your view on it? Is it a good influence or a bad influence? Is it a good addition into the digital currency world or is it something bad? You've touched on a lot of points and I want to address every one of them. So the first thing is my theory in today is the same as my theory was five years ago. Five years ago, I lived in South Africa and I had a, a mantra or a theory that I used to live by. Make money in South Africa because it's relatively easy and switch your money into US dollars because the South African currency was consistently depreciating. If you weren't transferring your South African rands into US dollars immediately, you would lose. Let me give you a personal story. I sold my company I had worked 17 years to build a company, 17 years of blood, sweat, and tears. If I tell you, I had the, the hardest business in the world. I used to place people in work. I had 30,000 people working for me on an, on, an, on an average weekend. It was the hardest business in the world, and I sold the business after 17 years. The day that I signed the contract with Publicis, which is the, 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 the international, the exchange rate was nine rand and 80 cents for one dollar. Now the transaction was paid in rands because it was a local transaction. Now, in the nine months that it took us to close the transaction, it had to go through the government competition commission and whatever else. When we finished going through the competition commission, the rand was trading at 15, dollar, 15 rand per dollar. I lost 65% or 60% of my wealth in nine months and I was helpless, I could do nothing about it. I literally sat there and watched the currency depreciate as I lost 60% of the wealth that took me 17 years to build. Okay? Now, I believe that the same thing's happening now with Bitcoin. If you're not earning in your own currency, be it the Turkish Lira or the dollar, and converting it into Bitcoin, then you're in the same place that I was when I sold my business in South Africa. And the truth is, you're gonna have to run and work so much harder to just keep the same level of international wealth. And that for me is a, I've learned that lesson on my own wealth. I don't know how many people out there worked for 20 years, built a business and then lost 60% of their money because just because the government was doing crazy things. So that's my theory today. My theory today is I earn dollars and I buy Bitcoin and I spend dollars. I don't ever spend Bitcoin unless I have to for a poker tournament. 
Um, no, sure, it's a, it's a very strong point. Yes, it's, it's, and the problem, like you said, it used to be you have to worry about the rand or the Turkish lira or about the, you know, the Brazilian, uh, uh, gosh, what's the Brazilian currency? The, the real, the real, real. Real, that's right, real. Uh, uh, but now you have to worry about the dollar, right? I mean, the dollar, uh, the Fed printed more you have to money. Worry about, yeah, the Fed you printed have to worry more about money. Every currency in the world. You have to worry about every currency in the world. And I'll tell right. you why. It's, the cycle that's happening today is one of the most pathetic cycles in history. And it shows that, you know, we keep saying the economy is broken. The financial system is destroyed. Coronavirus did one thing. It destroyed the entire financial system in the world. And why? Because people escaped the emerging markets to get into U.S. dollars, which created U.S. dollar demand. And then the Fed and the government printed a whole lot of U.S. dollars to feed the demand. The result is that you have a glut. You have the Fed's balance sheet being the biggest that it can be. And if you listen to the comments, you know, today the government is effectively supporting the economy and supporting the stock markets. Everyone is getting their rents paid by the government, holidays paid by the government, interest holidays subsidized by the government, and the government is doing this through printing more money. It's the end of the cycle. It's the end of the US dollar. And the problem is that the emerging market currencies aren't doing any better. If you would have got into Bitcoin at the beginning of the cycle, you would have been safe. And that's exactly the point. Bitcoin is trading today exactly as it was trading at the beginning of the cycle. Now, that might not be a very attractive thing, but bear in mind how, much, how many more US dollars are now in circulation and how much the emerging market currencies have crashed. And then you'll realize that just by holding Bitcoin, again, you would have made money. Yeah, so, so the, the Fed has printed uh, more money in the last month than it did in 100 years, right? It doubled its balance sheet to over $7 trillion and it printed basically less than $1 trillion through 2008. And then the balance sheet went up to about $3.5 trillion since 2008. So, and every time it tried to unwind that, you know, the, the stock market and the financial markets have basically uh, threw up a tantrum and the Fed had to back out and lower rates and print more money. So you're right. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, Rome is burning and we're not doing anything. And, and I think uh, the, the, the biggest problem is that, that we are, we, the United States, are taking, or, or the government and the Fed, are really uh, taking advantage of the dollar as the reserve currency of the world. Because like you say, when everybody is trying to escape their fiat disasters in their countries and they're buying dollars, they think the dollar is safe and the Fed goes and, and basically print trillions of dollars, they don't see the debasement because in their local currency, it's still a strong currency, right? So, so we're, we're really uh, facing something that has never happened before and everybody's watching the dollar getting stronger and they think that, oh, look, printing money doesn't mean anything. Oh, look, printing deficits um, doesn't mean anything. Look, nothing is happening, right? And, and like we always say, you know, the, the last straw that breaks the camel's back, it's fine. You can put as many straws as you want. It just takes one, one event, one small event to break the camel's back. And there's no recovery from losing the trust of people not trusting the US dollar. If the people stop transacting, 70% of international commerce is denominated in dollars. So if people stop transacting in dollars, the US overnight loses its power, loses its ability to print all those dollars. So that's really the risk that both the Fed and the government are taking every day by borrowing more and more and more of the trust or of the power of the dollar. That's, that's my kind of uh, point of view on it. But I agree with everything you said. And, and I, guess, I guess what's going to happen is that we're only going to deal with the full implications in the next five years. And, um, you know, this is an election year. And then uh, five years from now, that term will be finished. And I think that, you know, if Donald Trump gets reelected, then uh, he's going to go out on a high, actually, because it's going to take five years for the implications of everything that's happening around us to actually hit. To hit. This is not something that happens immediately. Assets don't get devalued immediately or revalued immediately. This is something that really, really, really takes time. But they've destroyed it. The damage is done. And it's going to take time to flow into the, into the market and, to re, and for the market to reprice accordingly. Um, yeah. Which is, by the way, 
if you're measuring your wealth today in US dollars, then I would imagine that real estate in New York is actually a, a great, great investment today. Because two things are going to happen. One thing is that everybody's moving out of New York, apparently. So everyone's apartments are on a fire sale. I've seen crazy deals happen here. The second thing is that with a fixed property in New York and so much more money in circulation, the US dollar value of the properties eventually will have to go up. Assets will reprice. Um, and I guess that, you know, if, you, if you're in that mindset, then, you know, you can also, you don't have to look at Bitcoin. You can also look at other scarce assets in, in highly soft, sought after environments. No, it's true. And, and, and that's what the Fed is trying to do, right? That's what the Fed is basically putting a blanket under the U.S. economy. It's reflating the prices of assets. And it's the same thing that all the Keynesian Fed uh, chairmen have done in 2008 and 2001 and going back all the way to 1970, right? Where, where the problem actually started when we detached from, the, from gold. So, so the, the issue we're, we're facing is really that the debt, the mountain of debt that we have, about $250 trillion, does not change. It stays there. It accumulates interest. So if your assets drop from $300 trillion to $200 trillion, that is something that you will never get out of. You're not going to get out of bed if you know that no matter how hard you work, you're never going to get yourself out of this debt trouble. So what the Fed is, there's only two options. One is to reprice all the debt. And when you re recycle the debt, what happens? All the equity guys lose their equity and debt guys take over. And no one wants that. So what do they do? They reflate the asset values. If you bring your asset values back to that 300 trillion, then everything looks wonderful, right? Because your, your debt bubble stays the same. You can hopefully service the debt bubble. You're kicking the can down or the planet down the road. And, uh, you know, it, it's a shiny day every day. There's no there isn't a cloud to be found in the sky in New York today. So, yeah, but uh, the thing is, you know, I mean, you've got to break this, this cycle up into two parts. The people with money and people without money. People without money, which is 95 or 90, I don't know what the statistics are, but 90% of people, 99, 99% of people in the world actually love this because there's more money in circulation, the government's paying them, they're getting a paycheck, and everything is great for them. For the one, two, five, ten percent of the population that actually have assets, the assets are being repriced. Um, and that, you know, unless they're very smart and they can trade their way into real assets that are going to reprice accordingly, they're going to lose money. I guess it depends what assets you're in. If you're in commercial real estate, you probably are hurting right now. Uh, but if you're in, in many other assets, if you're in, uh, in Apple stock or in Microsoft stock or Amazon stock, uh, all these stocks are close to all time highs. So it really depends on, uh, on where you are. I think, the Wall Street has picked the winners and the losers. Uh, it, it basically already decided which technologies, which industries are going to come out of this post-corona era uh, as winners, and all the money is going there. And the guys who are losers, the airlines, the hotels, the kind of a few old industries like the car rental businesses and so on, are being dumped, and it doesn't matter what the price is, right? There's no fair value uh, for those assets. So let's go from the macro a little bit to the to the what's happening in our in our industry and community. You've been in crypto since 2015. Uh, tell us what you've seen, where you think we are, where we're we going to. Like, break it out for the people who are, who might be new or uh, people who are concerned right now. What are you doing with your uh, uh, you know digital gold? So, I mean, let's break up the crypto e ecosystem into digital gold and everything else. I don't want to spend too much time talking about digital gold because I think we've done that already by saying this is a time to be putting your money into digital gold. And there is a digital gold called Bitcoin and that blockchain actually works. It may be one of the only ones that is working properly in terms of what it was intended to do and it's doing it and there's no need to get to discuss that one any further. I think Bitcoin is... You know, I always say Bitcoin is the only blockchain that's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. <laughs> it was built for that and it's doing that and there's no risk. It's doing it. We've tested it. All the rest are still in the experimentation phase. So I don't think that we've seen any other blockchain deliver anything meaningful um, or real world yet. You know, I mean, yes, you've got Ethereum and you've got Tron and you've got, you know, EOS and you've got all those other ones. 
But I'm not sure that there's any blockchain that can stand up and say, you know what, this is actually better than what there was before and it's working efficiently. We're still, in the, we're still very much in the experimentation phase. The technology doesn't work very well yet. It's getting better and better with the different updates, et cetera. Ethereum 2.0 is, is making progress. There's blockchains like Algorand, you know. So we are making progress, but none of them are proven. So the way I see it is you've got two buckets in this, in this space. You've got digital gold and very high risk VC. Now, very high risk VC has high risk profile and very, very high return profiles. And I guess that's where we are today. I'm expecting that, you know, over the next couple of years, all the projects that raised money uh, in 2017, 2018 will start running out of money if they haven't run out of money already. And I think it's very hard to raise capital today for a new blockchain project. So we'll get a big consolidation in the market where, you know, the good ones are actually going to rise to the top and the bad ones are going to disappear. And so, you know, without giving anyone investment advice, certainly what my strategy is, is to identify the winners, the ones that have got traction and momentum at the moment, and to invest behind those as part of a VC strategy or a personal venture capital strategy that we've got or that I've got. Um, that's really how I see the segmentation of the market. The market is, is murkied and clouded by a whole lot of projects that managed to raise free money in 2017. And they, you know, they're still there. There's still coins that I look at them and I go, how the hell does this coin have any value? Um, and I guess now it becomes a momentum play. How much momentum have you got? Now, when you talk about momentum, I think that technology, blockchain technology is going to be commoditized pretty soon. Pretty soon as in, you know, talking about years, one, two, three years. I think transactions and security are going to be commoditized. There's going to be very little difference in cost. It's going to be dirt cheap. It's going to be something that we don't actually think about. I think what is going to be important is how well blockchains can activate their communities or foundations that are managing blockchain resources can activate their communities to build a protocol. Let me tell you what I mean. So there are a lot of people here that hold tokens in a, a protocol, Ethereum, EOS, Algorand, Tron, you name the protocol. How many of those people have said to themselves, I own a whole lot of EOS or Algorand or Ethereum tokens, and therefore I am going to build the Ethereum or Algorand or EOS ecosystem. When I say build the ecosystem, I mean, I'm gonna invest in companies that utilize the blockchain. I'm going to mentor and nurture business people building on this blockchain to get that momentum. And that's, in my mind, the next piece of the puzzle. The we've raised money and built technology, and the next phase in blockchain is actually activating the community to get the network effects on the protocol. And that's where we are now. And there's very few blockchains who are doing this effectively. So Bitcoin does it effectively by mere fact that it's already got a lot of momentum. And it's, you can't stop Bitcoin now. It's, it's way too big. And the momentum that Bitcoin's got is way, way, way too strong. And you can't beat momentum. Ethereum has got it. Even though the technology is not great and doesn't really work properly, Ethereum has a lot of momentum in terms of they managed to attract the right developers and a lot of developers are building on Ethereum. And therefore, a lot of VCs are investing in a lot of projects building on Ethereum, and so the cycle happens. Now, the third project which is doing this, ironically, is Tron. So Justin Sun is not a technologist in my mind. He may claim to be, but he's a marketing machine. Right. And he's found a way to build a Tron community and to get people excited about investing on the protocol. In my mind, unfortunately, I think that the other blockchains are failing. Um, blockchains like, like EOS, like Algorand, amazing people and amazing technologies, but failing to activate communities to build on their protocols, and therefore they're not getting momentum. And you know, ultimately, what my concern is that you know, either they'll be left with an empty shell, in other words, a blockchain that nobody's using, or they'll be left with amazing technology, but no momentum in terms of investment and usage, and that's the end of the game.
No, look, I, I think you make a great point and uh, thanks for that analysis. I think it's going to be very helpful for our, for our viewers. The, the fight, just to say it in other words, uh, the fight is over transactions. And Ethereum today has, after Bitcoin, has uh, the volume. And, and uh, for most people who don't know, 80% of the volume on Ethereum every day is USDT, right? So, so if you look at the killer apps, uh, Bitcoin is the store of value killer app. And Tether on Ethereum is the form of payment killer app, right? So, so uh, Ethereum, by chance, found its uh, uh, killer app, and now it can support a thousand projects that are all ERC20 uh, variants who are trying to come up with something additional, right? And, and if you look at what Tron and Algorand are trying to do, they're trying to steal a, a USDT from the Ethereum network because they need that volume of transactions to justify their blockchain. And we, we definitely don't if need they do, yeah we definitely if they don't, don't need a, a hundred and thirty different blockchain. The problem we have is that that you, like you're right. There's probably going to be three or four winners. Each one of them must have at least one killer app, uh, otherwise they can't survive. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that they're not competing for transactions as much as they're competing for community share of developers. You know. Y- can you attract developers to build on your ecosystem? Because if developers build cool apps or dApps, then people will use it and then you'll get lots of transactions. Also, yeah, that's what EOS developers tried to do and, and that didn't work out for them, right? They, gave, they threw $5 million on, on developers to just build on EOS. And the problem you have is that when you don't have that volume, it's a chicken and egg story, right? What came first, apps or the internet infrastructure? Well, one was driving the other and so on and so on. And we've seen it kind of really build the internet to what it is after 30 years. So the same thing here, you, you cannot build an, an amazing app on a blockchain that has no users or no, or no volume because the miners are not interested, the, the you know, mm-hmm. it, just, it, it just, the engine doesn't start. And, and Ethereum, again, it wasn't by design. It's not like Vitalik sat there and said, oh, I'm gonna, you know, the Bitcoin Foundation doesn't want my smart contract. I'm gonna start this new thing and I'm going to make sure that uh, the Tether shows up and puts their coin on my chain, right? So, 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 I mean, if you look at Ethereum, there's three reasons why in my mind Ethereum worked. The first thing was timing. Ethereum was first to market in terms of smart contract, decentralized smart contracts. The second thing was ethos. The ethos of Ethereum was around decentralization. It wasn't a compromise on decentralization. It was... You know, Ethereum believes truly in decentralization. That's the third thing. So the second thing. The third thing is very simply Joe Lubin. And why? Because you have someone who is a shrewd business person who decided to build the ecosystem around Ethereum like a business. Awarding grants, creating funds, creating consensus, etc., etc. Now, when you do that, you've got an ecosystem that works. Can you name one other community other than Bitcoin that has a working ecosystem today in the blockchain community? I mean, I can help you. There aren't any. The well, closest the only, one. Yeah, the only one that kind of uh, has any chance is the IBM uh, platform. Obviously, it, obviously, it's not a public blockchain, but, but uh, most, most uh, non-crypto projects are running on the... Uh, on the IBM uh, infrastructure, right? I think like 90%. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you, so you have like the, basically the closed uh, internet version, which is the intranet, which is the IBM version. You have the open version, which is, you know, like you said, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. And now you have a government version, right? Like China is trying to do. So to tell us what, what's, what are your views on the government version of the blockchain? Well, I think it's inevitable. I mean, I guess that, uh, you know, holding on to paper money is just the most ridiculous thing in the world. I think that now that people are talking about coronavirus and money being dirty and spreading money, it's, it's expedited the need for this digital money. Uh, most most guess, of our transactions every day are digital anyway, right? With our bank and exactly. so on. Exactly. Just not... What I, find, what I find absolutely idiotic is that while China 
is making huge strides on a block, a centralized money on their blockchain, which will, which would make for a form of digital money without the double spend problem. Steve Mnuchin is talking about giving people a debit card. I mean, what century are you living in? Uh, everyone must have a debit card. No, everyone has a mobile phone. Right. Duh. Why well, don't he you do he a has never, He's never used Alipay or WeChat Pay, so he doesn't know what you're talking about. But, but uh, uh, do you see a chance that China, through this uh, you know, centralized blockchain, can compete with the US dollar as a form of payment? Look, I think China's got a marketing problem. China's got a marketing problem because non-Chinese people um, are very skeptical of holding China, anything that is controlled by the Chinese government um, because of the authoritarian nature of, of the Chinese government. I don't know if China can ever change their marketing problem. So I guess, you know, there's going to be a clear line between the East and the West. And, you know, maybe the people in the East would be comfortable with it. But we also know that a lot of Chinese people uh, you know, China is still the biggest market for Bitcoin in the world, um, even though it's banned again. So I guess that, uh, you know, I think that they are going to get a head start. You know, one of the things we must rewind to is when Facebook wanted to launch Libra and those embarrassing, ridiculous hearings that were held on public television where members of the U.S. Congress embarrassed themselves by asking stupid questions and unrelated questions in the face of what would have been a great innovation. And the best thing that could have come out of that was that the US government would have said, look, Facebook, we'll allow you to launch Libra as a US dollar stablecoin, which I believe is what is happening in, in the back end anyway, or these are the rumors that I'm led, I'm led to believe. So, you know, that should have happened. And instead of knocking, using it as an opportunity to drive non-related agendas, like how many people of color run the foundation and how many women are benefiting from this, they should have said, this is a great innovation, which puts us on par with China. Please pursue it. But I guess, you know, yeah, the, the, the USA has an innovation problem. I think the USA, you know, is very, very, very over-regulated at the moment. Uh, the regulation is over enforced, and as a result, people aren't innovating here, and we're well, seeing it, people falling behind. When, when you can print, uh, uh, I think the total right now is seven point three trillion dollars in just two months, right? And nothing happens. Why do you need to innovate? You understand? So the issue is that that we, w you and me, are innovators, serial entrepreneurs. We can't. It's oozing out of us, right? We can't stop. We have to innovate, no matter what. But when you're a bureaucrat working in the government and you press the printing button or you go to your spreadsheet and you add a zero and nothing happens, you go like, hey, let me do that again. Let me do that again. It, that is much easier to do than to enable a whole new uh, ecosystem uh, like Libra, right? Now, I, I'm not a big supporter of Facebook because I feel that they are, they, they are, they are evil. They're not even trying not to be evil, right? So I think... Anyone else showing up and saying, hey, we want to build this, they probably would have gotten uh, uh, past the finish line. But because it's Facebook, I think a lot of the regulators, a lot of the politicians took advantage of it to promote their own agenda. And, and uh, Facebook didn't have a chance, right? Alex, can I ask you a question? Do you think, would you define the U.S. as a capitalist society? So, yeah, it's a great question. I think we are, remember, I, I was born in communism, grew up in Israel, socialism, and, and uh, was in the United States for 30, uh, 33 years now. And when things are good, the United States is the most capitalist uh, system in the world. But when things go bad, we turned into the most socialist country in the world, right? Right now, what the United but States... I mean, but I mean, capitalism, capitalism is not... And if then, it's a, it, you either, it's in the United either, States, it is. Look, the Fed chairman, the Fed chairman, in his 60 minutes address, said it better than anybody else. He said, during good times, we should have taken some of our spoils and used it to reduce the deficit. But now is not the time to do it. Now, five minutes after we wasted all of our precious money on stock buybacks and dividends and whatever, Let's print another $10 trillion, right? So the problem we have is that during the great times, 
when we are all capitalists, we don't behave in a responsible way. And then when times turn bad, we don't behave in a responsible way, right? So, so when are we going to behave in a responsible way? I'm, I have a backbone. I, I care about uh, the 99%. I care about my children and the next generation. And, and for us to reach to the future and borrow and steal from our kids because they, all we've done is created IOUs that they have to pay in taxes. Taxes will go up no matter what. Otherwise, we can just shut down this whole country if we don't want to repay the debt. Hold on, hold on. Taxes in this country are, the, are amongst the highest in the world. And specifically in New York, I would imagine that they are the highest in the world other than really socialistic countries like maybe They're Sweden. They're going to go higher. Okay. Ron, if you, you cannot then, have... You cannot, right now we're at $26 trillion deficit. These are the, the funded liabilities. The unfunded liabilities are over $100 trillion. So Don't even go there. But my point is that every child that is born in the United States, right now here in the hospital, they're born with over $200,000 worth of debt that they owe China and Korea and Japan and all kinds of other countries, right? Germany and so on. So the... <clears throat> You cannot escape that. It's not like you can wake up. I mean, I know Donald Trump tried that, right? He woke up one morning and said, maybe we don't, we're not going to pay China the $3 trillion worth of, uh, you know, U.S. treasuries that they own. You can't do that, right? The minute you do that, you're done. So I think the options we have are, are we going to pay the debt or are we going to debase the currency? These are the only two options we have. And it looks like we're going with option number two, right? So... So, but anyway, look, we, we, we're not going to solve all the world's problems here. But what, what I want to, what, what I know you don't, I'm not asking you to predict prices on Bitcoin or anything like that. I'm just asking you to, to, to give, share with the viewers what you're thinking of what's facing Bitcoin, right? Are, are, we, are we turning left? Are we turning right? Are we proceeding the way we're going for right now? Is everything wonderful? What are the issues that you think are the biggest issues for Bitcoin? You know, this is a, a very good question because I believe very often I have a lot of money, a lot of my personal wealth in Bitcoin. And, it, you know, I have to be, I have to step away and say, you know, have I drunk my own Kool-Aid and am I buying this digital bullshit, digital money thing? And, you know, you know, because I've been in the industry for too long. Yeah. But then I ask myself a question. Is this, is this gaining adoption or losing adoption? And the answer is very clearly that Bitcoin is gaining adoption. Specifically, the best thing that could have happened is what's happening now. This is what Bitcoin was built for. It's panning out right before our very eyes. And guess what? People who ordinarily wouldn't even imagine buying such a risky asset are phoning me and saying, hey, how, how do I buy Bitcoin again? Just, just tell me what, what I do to buy those Bitcoin things. So, so oh, sorry. So yes, so th that's the first part of it. So I think that Bitcoin must continue to rise for as long as there is adoption. Are there any systemic risks that could happen? Governments could still ban it. So the USA could, could pass a law and say that, you know, you know that uh, anyone who holds Bitcoin, it now becomes a criminal offense. You know, what would happen then, I don't know. Um, I don't know if they well, can do well, it. Russia just, just suggested, Russia suggested seven years in jail for transacting. Yeah, so, so again, that's one of the systemic risks that could happen. I mean, I don't think that there are many other risks. You know, c can something with so much momentum lose momentum? Hard to, hard to believe that could happen. Um, could there be a better Bitcoin? There are already better technologies out there, but technology without momentum is nothing. Um, you know this. There's been hundreds of very good technologies in the world, but if you can't get adoption, then your technology is worth nothing. Um, and so I don't think there's a technological risk to Bitcoin. Yes. Um, so, you know, I guess that, you know, in my mind, Bitcoin is actually a relatively safe investment. It, it, to me, it's much safer than gold, which is custodied at some of the central banks of the world. Uh, to me, that is a, you know, that's a no, a no go zone. Already, well, gold, gold is a fifteen trillion dollar assets. It's a much bigger ship, and uh, you know, like uh, we we are in like a, this little uh, speedboat. Yes, we're going ten times faster than gold, but you know, gold is going to make it to the destination. We just might get there first, but we might also drown on the way. So, so my my recommendation to people, and again, this is not financial advice, but 
is, is that you must have some money in gold as well because it's the other non-dollar -den denominated asset, right? So, so you have to split your bets and you gotta take, put some of the money in your slow boat and you gotta put some of the money in the, in the fast boat uh, but you know, don't have all your eggs in one basket. That's good. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly what I'd say. You know, you talk about the slow boat and the fast boat. You know, remember when Amazon was selling books and they had a five percent share of the book market in the world? You know, we all said that, that was then the fast boat. This, that was then the small boat. Uh, <laughs> today, the small boat is. You know, I don't have to tell you what's happened to Amazon of late. They so, have every uh, boat. Very, Amazon is every boat, yeah. every container. I think, in, I, I think if you're in Bitcoin, you're in the right boat. Right, right. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about Telegram and what the SEC has done and, and Satoshi's vision. Uh, what's your views on, on the latest news in those areas? So Telegram, in my mind, is very, very sad. Um, why? Because the SEC, with this whole guise of protecting investors, just, you know, that they, let's understand that the SEC's rule of, um, function is to protect investors. Basically, and then follow the law. They cannot. They don't create new law. Their job is to only follow existing law. Just to clarify. exactly, they're the cop. They're not the judge. They're not the uh, you know. They don't make laws. It's a great. I mean, you know, you're talking about this whole area of securities versus non-securities in terms of token is very much a gray area. Um, and I mean, just to be clear, there hasn't been a ruling on whether Telegram's uh, ICO is actually a security. There's no ruling on that yet. Yes. There's only a ruling that for now the SEC, that the injunction by the SEC can hold. Now, what they did was in the name of protecting investors, US investors, what they've done is they've destroyed innovation in a project which was very, very, very innovative in my mind. And at the same time, they've created a haircut for the US investors of at least 28%. Because they got 72% refunds on the money that they invested after they invested it for a year. Now, I don't know, to me, is that really protecting investors? You know, I think what they did was they cost the US investor 28% of their money um, and they completely stifled innovation. And, you know, I think it's unfortunate that, you know, it's not the first time that we've seen this happening and that we've seen them stifling innovation and bullying companies. These are people that have unlimited budgets. You know, you talk about uh, Kik, the messenger app. They, no matter how much money they raised for their fund, how do you go up against the SEC? Effectively, the SEC put them out of business for all intents and purposes. That's true. You know, yeah, so I mean, they, they had a, 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 a staring contest, right? The, the Telegram and the SEC had a staring contest and Telegram blinked. Uh, EOS and the SEC had a staring contest and, and the, the SEC the blinked. SEC blinked. Exactly. Yeah, the SEC so, so the question is why after seeing, after seeing uh, EOS result, which was only, only a $28 million fine on a $4 billion raise, uh, why did they decide to go this way? And, and, and actually, my point is that you know, the, the, the security token business has never taken off. And even if they were categorized as a security, and this was an exceptional opportunity to launch that entire business, right? If I was if I was a CEO of, of Telegram and the SEC said to me, "Hey, uh, you're a security. Fine, you know, let me define this as a security. I'll follow all the rules and regulations, and I'm going to launch the whole simple. industry." It's not that simple, and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of the utility that is required that the Telegram Telegram token, the Ton token or the Gram was required to do, um, wouldn't have worked if it was a security. You know, securities have to be sold by broker dealers. Broker dealers, you know, need to be licensed. There's holding periods. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, well, returning, opinion, money, returning the money is, uh, is definitely not the solution here. Right? We're not going to get any innovation if, if we all return our money to our shareholders and say, sorry, you know, I tried. It didn't work out. Here is a Well, I'll tell you what happened. Dollars. I'll tell you what happened. Every U.S. investor lost at least 28% of their investment. Yep. You know, you take that, times that by 1.8 billion that they raised. The SEC destroyed $450 million. Where did that money go? So the first thing is Telegram got a free loan. Or, sorry, they got free servers and free money because they didn't spend $450 million building a, um, 
They didn't build, spend $450 million building a blockchain. They used it to buy servers and enhance their messenger app. And, so, and they got that money for free. So, you know, they gave you back the money. Thanks for playing. Uh, the second thing is, I understand that about $50 million went to lawyers. So lawyers made money. You know, that's, that's pretty much what, what the end result was. And the U.S. investor, of which there were about $500 million, lost 28% of their money. So well done, SEC. Uh, destroyed $120 million for U.S. investors. Yeah, it's definitely not the right way to move forward. You know, it's a, it's a horrible outcome. Yeah. Uh, I think we said we we're going to talk about uh, uh, Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. Um, I don't know if there's much left to talk about after what we saw in the last few days with the messages being signed against Craig Wright. I mean, he's just getting more and more egg on his face. Uh, I think he's lost all credibility and... Uh, Right. I don't think he managed to keep it going for a while, though. You know, that's like a, it's free entertainment for the entire community. You know, and unless you're a B, unless you're a Bitcoin SV holder, in which case it's not that free. Yes. Yeah. It's. Uh... Sorry. I see lots of people are looking for you, Alex. Yeah. No, I have another call right now, so it's uh, you know they're just being very uh, persistent. But uh, all right, look. I think this was a good overview of what's happening. And, uh, um, you know, I, I think we are definitely facing a, a fork in the road because uh, this is a perfect lineup. If, if uh, there couldn't be anything better as far as a lineup for Bitcoin, right? If you look at uh, the Corona bubble popping, the debt bubble, the Corona uh, pandemic popping, the debt bubble, uh, the Fed going and printing more money than, than in a hundred year history, right? Uh, the happening happening, all these things happen at the same time and Bitcoin cannot break $10,000, right? It, it touched it a few times and it retreated. So, so count your blessings that Bitcoin is not over $10,000. Keep I buying. Because I mean, you, my point is I'm saying it, I'm saying that, that, and this lineup should have been a, a home run uh, uh, and, and we should have seen a tremendous acceleration and adoption, right? Because uh, anyone who understands anything about what's happening should have looked at this and said, okay, uh, I have to load up my house, my stocks, my bonds, my income is all denominated in dollars. Uh, after seeing the Fed take this action, me and you understand that, right? I bought more Bitcoin. But, uh, but most people are still thinking, well, look, the stock market has just, it has just gone back to all-time highs. Uh, you know, I don't the, have to worry about the, it. The longer, the longer Bitcoin stays under 10 grand or even 9 grand or hopefully under 8 grand, the better. Simple. Because there are going to be very few opportunities to buy at these levels in the long term. And so for me... Keep it low. I, I, you know, I really hope the price goes down to six grand again so I can buy some more. Um, keep earning in dollars, buying Bitcoin. That's what I'm doing. I'm not giving anybody financial advice, but that's really what my strategy is. Right. I'm just, I'm raising that. Obviously, I'm a Bitcoin mac maximalist, but I'm just raising this because in, uh, the rate of adoption, you know, I'm a VoIP guy, right? So uh, yeah. I, I'm used to hundreds of millions of people joining, not hundreds of thousands of people joining. So, so seeing, seeing, uh, uh, not seeing the hockey stick coming uh, tells me that there are some things that we still have to address. And a lot of it has to do with risk and, and uh, with uh, basically the way Bitcoin started, where it started with such negative connotations. You had so many great guests on your show. So tell me, one, one of the problems that I, that I think that we have as an industry is that the the leaders or the, the heroes that brought us here are not the heroes that are going to get us to mass adoption because I think we have still have a stigma problem. So tell me what you think about that. I agree with you 100%. I couldn't have said it better. I think the other problem, not, not, not problem, but you know, you talk about the heroes that got us here, not the heroes that are going to get us into the future. Remember the type of person that bought Bitcoin, either very staunch libertarian people or tech geeks or video game geeks. These are the people that, that, that bought lots of Bitcoin in the beginning. If you look at the profile of them, 
Now, some of them do have the, 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 the stuff to take us forward. You know, if you look at the, the Winklevoss brothers, I think they, they are great in terms of taking us forward. Why? They're business people. They're not, they're not geeks. They're business people who are investing in the ecosystem. You look at a, a guy like CZ. CZ, again, he, I mean, he's, he's a little geeky, but, uh, you know, he's an investor and a businessman in this, pro, in, this, in this industry. I think the biggest mistake that we can make is to take somebody who made a lot of money because they bought Bitcoin cheap and to assume that that person is a very smart businessman and a very smart entrepreneur and is going to build amazing things. I think that, you know, I say that in time, everything comes back to equilibrium. And I think equilibrium will happen where those people aren't going to add as much value to the ecosystem and entrepreneurs are going to add their value to the ecosystem. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, and, and, you know, like, and having people like Paul Tudor Jones, Mike Novogratz, uh, Joe Lubin, you mentioned, I mean, we have a lot of great people that, that are here to help this community grow. They, they really believe in the asset class. And, and, uh, but we also have a lot of speculators who are just tourists, right? And, and when we like speculators. Speculators are, are very important in terms of, of price of uh, of price discovery. I think another another they're part important if they're very... ten or fifteen percent of your total membership. If they're fifty percent of your membership, that's why you yeah. that's when you cannot break through the ten thousand uh, level because every time you touch it, uh, a bunch of speculators jump in and and short the hell out of you, right? So. So uh, the question is balance, right? And, and the community, the base of the community, which is mostly hodlers and long-term believers, long-term investors, is not broad enough to support all these speculators. I think another, I mean, another big party that we need to talk about is Andreessen, Andreessen Horowitz. They are very, very, very good for this industry. Look at it however you want. You know, when you're talking about a VC of that caliber, starting to raising a $500 million fund in crypto, that's that's a very 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 good sign for this industry. They're they're mostly focused on like DeFi and protocols, right? They're not they're not really they're not investing in a broad way uh, across the like you. I think you're a much broader investor in, in different uh, parts of the ecosystem. They pick two winners that they think are going to be the long term winner, right? The protocol layer and uh, the DeFi layer, and they're they're plowing tremendous amount of money behind their companies. Well, look, Alex, I wouldn't, I'm at the point now where I wouldn't invest in a good project building on a bad protocol. So, you know, <laughs> good, you know but really, good. yeah, I mean, I in agree, the old I days, we would, in, we would invest in, in lots of protocols. Now we are actually quite selective. I mean, you know, if someone came to you and said, look, I'm building a great project, but I'm building it on some no-name protocol or a protocol that you don't think is going to survive, would you invest in the project? Absolutely not. You yeah. can't. So I think that the support the protocol and support the companies building on the protocol, that's the right approach. Um, so so I, have a, I have a question for you because you looked at Celsius from the beginning, like from day one, and, and there was such doubt, so much doubt in the entire industry around this interest income product, right? Now everybody's trying to copy Celsius and our business model, but, but in the beginning, uh, even though the math works, the, the algorithm worked, everything worked, uh, almost everybody looked at it and said, no, nah, it's too good to be true. It's just not going to happen. No one's going to give you their coins, Alex. Come on. I mean, Alex, Alex, you have, to, you have to look back to when you guys did the ICO. And that was like, I think, 2017 when you were doing the road shows. And, you know, there was this crazy lunatic guy who invented VoIP sitting, you know, and walking around conferences telling people that he's built a system where you can earn interest on your Bitcoin, which then was a very foreign concept. I mean. You know, Bitcoin was the one problem with Bitcoin was that you couldn't earn any interest on it or you couldn't earn a return on it. That was one of the big flaws. And then you have this guy who's, you know, he's a geek and he's, you know, he says, look, uh, I built VoIP and you look, really, you built VoIP and then you do a Wikipedia search and, you know, he actually did build VoIP. And then you go, he's now spending his time talking about raising money for an interest platform on crypto. Now it's a dime a dozen. Now everybody's doing it because it's, there's two ways to make money in this ecosystem at the moment. You can own an exchange or you can own a Celsius or one of the competitors. There's no one else making money in the industry. Right. right. No one else is making money. Everyone well, else is, is the only one making money in our business, right? We're the only profitable Celsius in the Celsius uh, copycat. But, 
But I'm saying that not to ask you for compliments. I'm saying that because uh, I really think that uh, interest income in a world where the Fed and every other central bank is going to zero negative rates, interest income is the easiest product. It's even more important than payments, right? Because everybody needs to earn yield. And if you can earn yield on stable coins, if you can earn yield on, on crypto, if you can earn yield on gold, we, we're now paying 4% gold on gold, right? With uh, Tether Gold. And uh, that changes the, the whole reason of why somebody would cross the chasm and join our community, right? So I'm saying it like, for me, I'm, I'm a big Bitcoin holder like you. The only way we get coins to go up in value is if we bring more utility, right? Not more volatility. So, so uh, why, I mean, you know, look, why uh, is it so hard for Alex, I must to say, I must say, I mean, you are, I mean, your core business is actually enabling the speculators. Because if I'm borrowing Bitcoin from you, there's only one reason why I'm borrowing it, and that's that I can short, you know, so that I can hedge my positions. Right. So, so I mean, that's not 80 80 percent of our use uh, of our of, of people who borrow from us are for, not for shorting. They're they're using it for, for hedging, market making, or or hedging. Right. So so if there's a ten dollar price difference between Coinbase and Binance. Uh, you're going to borrow coins and you're going to lock up that price, right? So you're not going to do it with your own money because if you bought Bitcoin with your own money and it happens to flash crash right at that time, you lost 10%. But if you borrow those coins from Celsius and you're trying to capture a 1% gap in pricing, you can actually capture it no matter what the price is, right? So, so 80% of the use case is not shorting. So we, 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 we do enable institutions. We only lend to institutions. We have about 260 of them, right? But, with, but about 20% is, uh, is for shorting purposes, uh, which is uh, less than what Wall Street has, right? If you look at SEC lending on Wall Street. I, I must say, Alex, we're not aligned here because I actually believe the speculators are good. And in every market in the world, if you want to bring interest, you've got to bring the money. And if you want to bring the money, the money sits with Wall Street. And what do Wall Street make their money? They make their money out of speculation. So for me, the more speculators we will bring in, the more efficient the markets will become. And when the markets become efficient, that's, you know, that's where we want to be. So I'm actually for, I mean, I'm for speculation. I, I really, I'm not one of these people oh, that's right. against yeah. speculation. Uh, my point is that the big short guys or long guys are, are uh, institutional wise, are uh, using futures and options. They're not use, they don't use uh, borrowed coins because like Paul Tudor Jones, right? He bought almost $500 million worth of Bitcoin. He bought it in the futures. He didn't buy it uh, with physical ownership. So, and he just rolls. How do, you hedge, how do you hedge the future? Well, he doesn't need to hedge. He's long only, right? But so, uh, yeah, who's the other not, side of the future? Well, the, the, the other side of the future, or the, the party that sells the future to Paul Trudeau Jones is somebody who was hedging it, arbitraging it against the spot market, right? So they, if they sold the long position on one side, they have to go and short it on the other side. But my point is, is that- exactly that the big institutions are not uh, playing today in the spot market. They're all playing in the future or option market because in many cases, even in their charter, they're not allowed to hold the uh, cryptocurrencies. So, so the, yeah. the issue we have is, is, is that uh, that is still considered taboo. Uh, I did a lecture in front of uh, 250 Wall Street compliance officers and asked them how many people here have this asset in their uh, in their group or in their possession or personally, and not a single hand went up. So, so we have not made a lot of progress uh, besides Fidelity and TD Ameritrade or somebody else. We have not really made uh, that much progress there. But look, we we both agree that speculation is a good thing. The question is how much? Too much speculation, and and you're stuck in the range. And uh, not enough speculation and your your uh, your bubble. Uh, Alex, I, I believe in efficient markets, and I think we're beyond we're beyond the days where whales could manipulate the price of Bitcoin. When I say whales, the, the traditional old term holders who had five hundred plus or a thousand plus Bitcoin in their account, those days are finished. I think we're in a speculators' market, and I think speculators' markets are by nature efficient, or they go back to efficiency over time. So yeah, the more the merrier. Bring it on. The more speculators, the better. We need as much. We need as many people in this ecosystem as possible. All right. When the, when they call me, I'll tell them to go and talk to Ron. You know. But uh, <laughs> Ron, this was amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time. We we can't wait for your show to go back online and and. Uh, I'll let you know as soon as it does. 
keep bringing those uh, great interviews and, and keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you're good for the community and thanks for all of your contribution. And you too, Alex. I wish you guys are nothing but uh, this, the type of growth that you guys have been experiencing. It's been, a, it's been an amazing journey to watch, uh, to watch you grow the business and grow it so in such a stable, sustainable, responsible way. It's been amazing. Well done. Well, it's, it's uh, not that hard when you act in the best interest of your community. You know? So that's, uh, that's what we've been focused on from day one. You know, Alex, I, I want to just, just say something, you know, like, and it's, I'm not, I'm not uh, looking to give you compliments, but I really hope that, that I can keep my energy like you've kept your energy. I've never seen a guy who, I mean, this is not your first round. This is like your fifth round. Eight, and eight, yeah. Your eighth round, and you operate with the same energy and vitality as a guy who is hungry for his first round. Like, you operate with the same hunger as, as a person who is running a startup. And like, if, there was one th- if there's one thing that I really aspire to, it's, you know, I have, I've had one exit and by virtue of the fact that I've had one exit of a reasonable size, I often feel like I may not be as driven as I should be. And then I look at you and I think, you're hungry like a guy who's just got out of school <laughs> and hasn't got one dollar to his name. And like... Well, because... You know, your parents tell you that it's the road and not the destination. And you're like, forget about that. I just want to get to the destination as fast as possible. And so you got your first house and your second house and you got a bunch of kids and you, and you, 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 you go on fancy vacation and you realize you're not happy, right? So, so I, my, my happiest moment is, is uh, when I get, you know, I wake up in the morning and there's 100 emails in my inbox and 10 of them or 20 of them are from people who are saying, Thanks you for making my life better. Thanks for helping me understand what this is all about. Thanks for making me uh, make the right choices or, or educating me about this and that, right? Yeah. So, so th- that's what drives me. It's not, obviously I'm not doing it for the money, but, but uh, the passion comes from doing what you love. And when you, when you do what you love, you don't work a day in your life. So, so the road is uh, uh, the destination and, and, and uh, you only realize that with you and you in your 50s and 60s. So you all, you're not, you, you got another 10 you years. Me like, you inspire me like that because I, I look at Alex Mashinsky and I always say to myself, I really wish that after I've had as many rodeos as he's had and as many successes as he's had, that I've got the same hunger that he's got because it's, uh, Thank you, it's one of the anomalies of society. Thank you. And, and uh, like we say, when you do a good, you also do well. And, and if you can combine all those things into one, look, uh, VoIP was an amazing success, uh, not just for me, but for the entire planet, right? I mean, billions of people are using it for free basically every day. And, and uh, not everyone get a chance to do it a second time to influence or impact so many people in a good way. And that's why I'm so passionate about this because like for me, it's like, oh my God, I, 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 every day is important. Every day uh, is, is, uh, you know, is a day that we either deliver or we don't deliver for, for, for 7 billion people on this planet who you know, you know better than me, that neither the government or the central bank or any of the rich people in, in, in their countries are going to do anything for them. So, so that's what our focus is. Uh, I've got this image of you um, at the age of 97 in a, in a, in a hospital bed, you know, sitting there on your laptop and reinventing a new industry, I guess. <laughs> I, I hope so. I, I am, I'll be happy. This will be, uh, you know, uh, Nirvana, you know, no problem there. I have no problem working seven days a week, you know, man, you're a big inspiration. Alex, thank you so much for your time, my friend. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Ron.